In order to stay close to the heavens, sacrifices must be made. Especially if you also want to be a humanoid with opposable thumbs. Rito hands, at least on the first glance, are weirdly cartoony for a setting that, although stylized, remains pretty realistic. But what if I told you that bird people anatomy makes perfect sense and is echoed by the Rito way of living? I'm Draken Wild, and this is Rito Biology. Okay, so uh, first order of business. Feathers do not behave like this. They lack joints and muscles and all that jazz. Of course, we can assume cartoon logic, but then this whole video would be pointless, and I'm not about to let this happen. <laughs> Besides, it's more fun that way. So, anyway. These are not feathers, these are fingers. Very thin, long, bat-like fingers, covered in vein like any regular feather shaft and thus able to generate lift. If you look at the Rito wing up close, in very specific lighting, you will notice that light refracts differently on their hands than the rest of the wing, clearly marking, well, fingers! Everything around and further up the forearm are regular, genuine feathers though, creating a surface for flying, most of it concentrating up to the elbow. Past the elbow, on the arm, feathers are still present, though the surface they create is much smaller, almost non-existent. That is most likely an evolutionary adjustment. Since their wings are doubling as hands, feathers on their arms would constantly get caught on their body and break. Their absence saves the energy needed to constantly regrow them. Adjustment like that has severe consequences, however. Their wing surface is reduced, eyeballing it by over half of what it could have been if they just had a dedicated wing like regular birds do. This means Rito actually aren't well suited for flight. Their wings simply can't generate enough lift force for them to ascend. Instead, what they actually do is glide. They jump from higher points and catch updrafts in order to stay in the air, quite similarly to what large birds of prey do, though they do it to conserve energy rather than out of necessity. But hey, at least they have hands! Yay! Becomes way less exciting when you stop for a moment to consider what living with a giant long-fingered and hollow-boned hand like that would look like, because, yeah, Rito bones are most certainly hollow, to reduce body mass and keep them from plummeting down to the ground whenever they try to glide. And then, on top of all that, is one more issue. Rito clearly evolved as meat eaters. Most of them sport sharp, hooked beaks and strong talons for hunting prey from the air. This is all well and good, until it isn't. In order to see their targets clearly from high up in the air, Rito evolved an eagle-like sense of sight. It is unparalleled across all other races of Hyrule. However, as is the case with pretty much everything related to Rito's flight, it came at a price. Rito eyesight is the best there is, yes, during the day. At night? They might as well be blind. Pale light of the moon and stars is not enough for them to illuminate their surroundings. The impact all these evolutionary adjustments had on the Rito way of living cannot be overstated. It is felt throughout all spheres of living, cascading down from architecture through things like warfare and academia all the way to foreign relations. It's part of Rito's very being. It's inescapable. So, without further ado, let's explore it. The sacrificial nature of Rito's flight nowhere is as apparent as in their architectural choices. 
It seems stupid. Why on earth would buildings, static and tied to the ground, the literal antithesis of flying, be even remotely related? Doesn't make any sense. Or does it? Flight is often seen as the most freeing power one can have. It allows you to go anywhere you'd like. In the case of Rito, however, it also strips them of the freedom to settle wherever they please. Quite on the contrary, their selection of possible locations is severely limited, and with that come limitations to architectural styles they can employ. Rito need to live high up, because they can't ascend by themselves. They need to be able to leap in order to fly. Presence of local updrafts is also strongly preferred, as is the accessibility on foot in case of a storm or some other emergency. These requirements already narrow down the options to nothing but mountains and not even all of them. But it doesn't end there, oh no! Because of their fragile bones, Rito can't work with large hammers to carve into rock. Or cut trees, or build in general, so they need help, land-based help, and a way to ferry in the materials. Thus, the pool of possibilities shrinks even more. Rito village is located in a very peculiar place. Surrounded by sheer cliffs on all sides, it clings to a ginormous rock spire, rising above a lake. Naturally occurring, strong updrafts are common in the vicinity. It's tall, it's windy, but also not remote. Nearby terrain is rough, but not impassable, and the immediate area around the lake is actually pretty flat and rich in timber. It is one of the very few places in Hyrule which fit so neatly into the needs of the Rito. Settling here was an easy, albeit consequence-heavy choice. The main objective was achieved. The village is vertical, attached to a single path spiraling upwards around a central rock for a total of three floors. All of that is very... Takeoff friendly. Both large and tiny landings are strewn about all across the spiral, planks outstretched into the vast sky and land below, just asking the Rito to make the leap. However, in order to accommodate the Rito glide to such an extent, something else had to suffer, and in this case, it was the housing. All of the buildings are located on the outside edge of the path, attached to it on floor level, but otherwise unsupported from the bottom. Well, in majority of the cases anyway. Where there was a possibility to do so, houses were sat on a rock perch. For most of the structures, however, such building conveniences were absent. So instead, builders of the village decided to hang the houses up, on giant chains, securely attaching them to rock structures overhead, as if the whole buildings were not but ginormous lanterns. This hanging city concept turns Rito village into the most unique settlement in all of Hyrule, but also the most precarious one. Subjected to the whims of the winds, the whole village creaks and moves ever so slightly. Only the highly specialized architecture stops the lantern houses from being torn away from the central pathway and thrown violently on their chains by the first strong storm. Rito houses are open on all sides. You think this is because of convenience. That way Rito can just freely fly inside, except wouldn't a specialized landing on the outermost side be enough to satiate the need of unobstructed access from the air? 
It would. Of course it would. The wall cover from cold winds, snow and rain wasn't sacrificed just for convenience of access. That'd be asinine. No, it was a crucial part of the architectural design of the village. In order for it to survive strong winds, the surface of buildings had to be reduced to the absolute minimum, allowing all the forceful blows to push through rather than strain the wooden bridges to the point of snapping. In exchange, Rito gave up the comfort of cover. They don't heat their houses, there's no point. They can't keep any warmth inside, instead they got used to the cold, relying on their feathers and clothing to avoid freezing in the unforgiving climate of Tabanfa. Frankly, the inhabitants are lucky if it's just the cold winds they have to deal with. Whenever it snows or rains, Rito have only the roofs above their heads to protect them, meaning that at least some of the fall is bound to end up inside their homes. Though, <laughs> given where the children sleep, Rito don't seem to take much issue with that. They probably don't think about it as anything unusual. Just some days they wake up blanketed by snow. No big deal. Yeah. So, while the Rito village is an incredible sight to behold, it is also a rather harsh environment to live in. It is probably why it doesn't get too many visitors. It is highly unlikely that anyone besides the Rito finds these conditions favorable. That stable next door might be putting the inn out of business soon. And then, on top of everything else, there's the issue of privacy. That is to say, Rito have none. The very design of their village doesn't allow it. In order to reclaim at least some of it, white, curtain-like strips of cloth are placed over a critical part of the window, loosely covering one of the sides, but only one, and most commonly, specifically that which faces downward direction of the main artery. Given that placement, Rito seem to care more about protecting themselves from the looks of outsiders, so coming in from the bottom, rather than their fellow Rito, I suppose it makes sense when their buildings are forced to be open at all times anyway. Actually, I do wonder, do they get hard cases of snooping neighbors? Like, stereotypically, it'd be grandmas, but Rita don't have those. Bert Karen's then? I mean, Rita in general seem like a gossipy type. There must be some etiquette in place, huh? Look at that village surveilling itself! <laughs> Jeez, this might be worse than getting snowed on in your sleep. Anyway, having buildings be see-through at all times is not the end of concessions that needed to be made in order for the Hanging City concept to work, although it is the most severe one. Other things include choice of materials and size of the huts. Rito Village isn't wooden just because it was convenient in this region. It's also due to limitations of metal anchors and the rock itself. If the houses were too heavy, one of these two things would snap, and it doesn't really matter which. The result would be the same. So, wood was chosen as the primary material because it's lighter than the alternatives and the size was reduced to a single and fairly small chamber only, to keep that weight limit in check. As a result, the huts aren't just cold and non-private, they're also tiny and extremely flammable. On one hand, Rito are covered in even more flammable feathers, so it checks out. On the other, Remember how I said they can't see at night? Rito lanterns only give off a dim glow, 
by far not enough for the residents to safely leave home at night. Fire-based sources of light probably could rectify that situation, but alas. It's a real problem, by the way. The lanterns. It sounds like nothing but mild inconvenience, until you consider that they are living in a world overrun by monsters with an active terrorist group on the prowl in a village guarded by people who wouldn't be able to see intruders half the time they're on duty. Nightwatch is mostly for show, is what I'm saying. Aside from that lovely issue, this twofold fire problem affects one more area of Rito life cooking. They obviously can't do it from their own homes. They like the space for it, for one, and even then, the wooden floor absolutely would catch fire. Not to mention the safety hazard this would be to anyone in the room, including the person doing the cooking. Those nice tails look like they would very easily find their way underneath the pot into the flames. This was a genuine issue, which Rito solved in a way that's both smart and kinda funny. They made a kitchen house. House that has a kitchen. It sits on a rock column, allowing it to have a cobblestone floor. It has a little chimney. It has kitchen supplies on the sides and a pot with a fire right damn smack in the middle. That fire honestly looks like a prisoner in a high security cell. It is kept as far away from any wooden elements as physically possible to prevent any random sparks from setting the entire building ablaze. It has a literal cage around it, preventing Rito feathers from getting inside, and it is kept in total and complete isolation. Because, yes, nobody lives in that house. It's just a pot and a fire. As far as I can tell, this kitchen is used as a communal one, on an as-needed basis. Everyone can access it if they so desire. Kind of like visitation for the fire inmate. I'm gonna stop now. Let me go back to the no walls thing for a second though, because it is a curse that keeps on cursing. Rito are smart, very much so. Their solution to the cooking problem is very creative and so are designs of their bows. Falcon bows are among the best in the whole of Hyrule. They employ sights, stabilizers and drawing aids masked nicely by decorative pieces at the tip. All unheard of across all but one other bow in the land, and that one, the ancient bow, was made by a genuine ancient technology specialist and specifically engineered to be the best bow that technology has to offer. It's a darn shame then that Rito don't have their own scientists. Like, at all. None. That sad state of affairs has nothing to do with Rito's own willingness to learn and has everything to do with... paper. Engaging in sciences requires paper, and lots of it. Books, notebooks for research, records, you name it. You need it all to raise a population of scientists. However, in Rito Village, paper seems to be a rarer commodity and, as such, is used sparingly. Because, as it turns out, being the very opposite of waterproof is a critical weakness for any material in a building that looks like this. It's the storage that's the main problem. Rito, quite literally, have no place consistently dry enough to keep large quantities of fresh paper, books and ledgers safe. They can sneak in a book in a cupboard here and there, but that's about it. Instead, for their day-to-day -day writing needs, they use wooden slabs. They come waterproof, in which they carve symbols and then bind them together, 
You can see these all over the village, stored on shelves in most houses. Thing is, these booklets are obviously hard to write in, and even when you do, they don't contain that much information due to the thickness of each page. Thus, they are only used for recording information that is immediately necessary and not much of it. So, what do they do for science, history and all that jazz? Well, simple. Oral tradition. Everything is passed down through generations. Son of a shopkeeper is expected to run a shop. Son of a bowmaker is expected to craft bows, children of a bard become singers themselves, and the eldest member of the village is expected to learn history from ballads and tall tales of the current elder. Generally, elder and bards are main sources Rito have on events from before their lifetime. As expected, their knowledge of history is very poor as a result. Even when it's something as important and as recent as a great goddamn calamity from 100 years prior, their knowledge is very limited. They have only the faintest of ideas about what meadow is, despite it circling right above their heads. They only remember one of the champions, Revali, and even then, their idea of him is skewed and exaggerated. Granted, oral tradition only really works for history and crafts, not for science. Hence, no Rito scientists. There sure as hell are Rito warriors though, and lots of them. Their plight, which they sacrificed so much for, combined with their fantastic long-ranged bows, gives them an edge over most opponents. Sounds like a perfect recipe for combat supremacy. Well... For as long as they can stay airborne, at least. If they are ever forced to land, mid-encounter and defend themselves on the ground, however... Oh boy! They cut holes in their swords! Holes! In the swords! And spears, too! Rito did that to reduce the weight of the blade, so that it doesn't overburden them during the glide. A hole like that, however, has consequences. It's a theme with the Rito, if you haven't noticed. In order to achieve a severe weight reduction, Rito sacrificed structural integrity of the blade. As a result, their swords are very weak. That's not all there is to it, however. Rito, due to their biology, are at an inherent disadvantage when grounded. Their long, thin fingers, weak and covered in vein, make it hard to get a good grip on a sword handle. And even then, their hollow bones are prone to break on impact. Rito will defend themselves on land if they have to, but they are laughably bad at it makes their guard outpost at the edge of town even more of a joke than it already was. Even just in general, grabbing hylian sized items with Rito's giant hands must be awkward and vain makes it hard to get a proper hold on things due to reduced friction. Because Rito's fingers are so long and thin, they only have the minimal amount of muscle necessary for movement making their grip rather weak. And then again, there are the bones. The brittle, brittle bones. Because of all this, available lines of work are pretty limited for the Rito. They can't engage in anything that involves large impact tools. Thus, mining and woodcutting are totally off limits, lest their fragile bones would break. And menial labor, like carrying heavy packages, for instance, is not the best of ideas due to the weakness of Rito's grip. There are no smiths in Rito village, that'd be extremely dangerous to the smith and the village as a whole, because, as discussed prior, fire hazard. There are no architects, because that would require the frequent use of paper, 
Rito are not prepared to use paper. There are no builders because, again, fragile bones, weak grip. So that leaves us with just a handful of options. Hunters, gatherers, scouts, guards, warriors, traders, singers and craftsmen. Rito excel at some, do just fine with the others. I'm looking at those cards, by the way, in case you were wondering. This list doesn't even begin to cover the needs of a whole village, however. For that, Rito more than likely rely on outside help. Contractors, if you will. It's probably precisely why there is a stable located right by the village gate and dealing in local timber, no less. Also, why the village is so gosh darn nice and accessible on all levels to folk who can't fly. All that is to say, Rito clearly have a good and long-lasting relationship with the Hylians. I'd go as far as to say that Hylians were very important to the creation of Rito village itself. As we just discussed, Rito aren't really builders and architects. They had to have received help with creating their town. All the metal parts, especially chains, had to have been imported from somewhere. Goron city, perhaps? The wood had to be cut and moved. All that. I don't think Rito sat idly by while someone else took care of the process, but I do think that they mostly played the role of supporters, carrying light cargo around, helping to establish bridges and scaffoldings, advising through design, things like that. After the construction was done, the good relationship remained. Hylians settled by the Rito village gate, participating in trade with the village and serving as a main trading hub, connecting it with the rest of Hyrule. It was also allowed to manage and benefit from wood production, perhaps as thanks for the help with the village's creation. Other than that though, Rito don't seem to have strong bonds with other races. Like, at all. Village is located in the coldest and very remote corner of Hyrule and pretty unwelcoming by design. No Zora, Gerudo or Gorons frequent the region. Frankly, it might be outright too frigid for all of them. Rito don't seem to mind though. They can handle all of their needs through the stable. If there is any communication between the Elder and other leaders, it is probably handled either by stable Hylians or by Rito messengers. I kinda doubt there is though. After Calamity, Hyrule became fractured and this state of things has become the accepted norm for the Rito. They live a simple life and don't have much care for Hyrule white politics, not that there are any at the moment. They just mostly want to be left in peace and allowed to fly. I think that the only link other races have to Rito are random Rito travelers seen wandering the land, Cass being the most prominent one. They aren't diplomatic envoys though, just tourists, I guess. And not very common either. Leaving Tabantha for more flatlands riddled by monsters is pretty dangerous when you can't ascend on your own, after all. I mean, Tabantha itself isn't exactly a safe heaven either. It just gives the Rito more opportunities to get back up and in the air than most other regions do. Same goes for Hybra. Those areas are commonly frequented by the Rito. The warriors patrol the village's territory, the hunters go in search of prey, gatherers bring back materials. It all works great until it doesn't. The mortality rate of adult Rito is rather high. It seems that the vast majority of them, both men and women, don't live long enough to become elderly. We've only ever seen one Rito of venerable age and he's the elder. 
Just from that name alone, we can gather that elderly Rito are a thing of extreme rarity, and thus widely respected. My guess is that Rito, being the strong-headed, proud types they are, might have a tendency to get themselves in potentially dangerous situations, which, together with fragile bones, doesn't create the best combinations. Flying incidents are also likely to be contributing factors. It's worth remembering that while Rito did indeed evolve to glide, they aren't in fact immune to gravity, and so anything going wrong while in the air can lead to a lethal accident. All of these add up, making it hard for the Rito to survive their adulthood. Power of flight sounds incredible on paper, but is it worth that though? Thank you for watching.